thanks very much to Rob and Pedro for organizing the meeting and for giving me this opportunity um, to talk about um, naming environmental nucleic acids um, sequences as fungi, which um, uh, both uh, Jingzhong and Pedro talked about um, today. And not knowing anything about how do I advance the slide? Oh, just with the thing. Easy. Okay. So we've been talking about names typified by a living or a dead fungus. And what I want to talk about is names in which there's no type, just a DNA sequence. And the first question is, why bother? Okay. And Pedro pointed out the reason, the reason to bother is that there are a lot of them. And um, he mentioned David Hibbett's uh, great talk in Edinburgh and also a uh, paper that came from it. And for, to me, this was the wake-up call. Oh, my God. There are a lot of fungi out there um, that we know only from a DNA sequence. And Pedro has his favorite um, tables. This is one of my favorite because it shows the addition of ITS sequence to GenBank with the, the white ones have a specimen and the black ones there's no specimen. And then if you look at the addition of operational taxonomic units, and Jing Zhang had the same slide, you can see that those that are environmental only, that don't, are not based on a specimen, now exceed those with a specimen, which is a frightening thought. We've just started this sort of um, ecological work. The other reason I'm interested in it is I actually have some practical experience. This is Tom Bruns and I in front of a crop of miscanthus and energy grass. And Tom, being an ecologist, we decided we would sample these for fungi that decay the grass in nature to see if we could find better decay fungi for industrial uses. And so Tom uh, samples carefully. So we had 17 sites, 10 in Louisiana, 16 samples per site. So we had 160 samples in Louisiana, for example. Here's Tom laying out the grid. And then you dive into the miscanthus and you pick up the dead leaves. And first, we wanted to cultivate them. So we used Gerald Bill's approach. We ground them up into tiny bits that ought to have no more than one fungus, washed away the spores, and then plated them out so that you'd only get one fungus per well. So you have to dilute them. And the idea is to get all the ones that we could, slow growers as well. So Prachan Shrisa, who was the postdoc, had 4,800 wells, 1,000 Petri dishes. And when Tim Zaro sequenced them, we had 100 molecular um, taxonomic units. So we got 100 species out of our 100, out of our actually samples from both miscanthus and sugarcane. Then Tom wanted to see what was there with 454. And so we amplified with a fungal-specific primer, um, screened the sequences for quality, went with ITS-1, which is the most variable, had 800,000 sequences that we could work with, and dropped the singletons from most of our analysis, figuring they might be errors. And so to determine what's an OTU, you have to think about the variation. So the, the y-axis is the number of operational taxonomic units that you'd get, and the x is the percent identity. And you can see that as you, as you restrict taxonomic units to closer and closer identity, there's an inflection, and you get a huge number of OTUs. These are probably errors. That are, that, so that's probably an artifact. So you want somewhere between the sort of level slope and the break. And we were conservative in the 94 to 95%. So using that, Tom found 3,200 fungi. So a multiplier of 32. Now it's, there's a caveat here, or an, actually a, a relief. The really common ITS sequences, or um, ENAS fungi, were recovered. We got about 70, 80% of those in culture. So they're really common ones we could get. But of course, these are fungi that are decaying grass, dead grass leaves. Those are about the easiest thing to culture that we could have. And this is for Patricia, who uh, last night was talking about statistics. These, these are rarefaction curves. And if they level off, you've sampled enough. You can see they haven't leveled off. So 3,200 is a low estimate of what's really out there. So what, where are they? These are, the, these are the reads that match to something in the database. 84% of our reads at a cutoff of 94%. So we got a lot of Ascomycota. We got a fair amount of Basidiomycota from the 454. If you do the cultivation, you get almost no Basidiomycota. 
If you look at the ASCO mycota, the biggest group here, shockingly, is unassigned. And that's because Megan is totally confused when it blasts a sequence to the database and it gets a mitosporic fungus and a fungus in, in the kingdom fungi. So one name, one, one fungus, one name is going to solve this problem. If you look at the basidium mycota, you don't see that problem because less dual nomenclature. But you see an amazing amount of tremolomycetes compared to agaricomycetes when you use the 454. What about the 16% that didn't match anything and aren't on this graph? So most of those matched an environmental, a big chunk matched an environmental sequence, and a big chunk were unmatched. So let's look at some of these. So this is, these are uncultured fungus clones. And let's look at one here. And you can, with just that information, you could go to GenBank and drag out the sequence. And then you can blast it. So there's, a, there's the one that we used to blast. And you can see all the ones that are close to it are uncultured fungus. GenBank has this tool you can make a distance tree of what you found. And if you do that, here's a distance tree from GenBank. There's the one that we added. Let's see what it's close to. So you can see here are the names of all these other fungi that are close to this fungus. And I've highlighted them. They're all uncultured fungi. So that really does you no good if you're an ecologist and you don't know a lot about fungi. Or may maybe you do, but you don't know all the groups. You've got your four or five four sequences that are out there in nature. And you do this, OK, what are they? So how can these sequences be named? So we could do them in, try to do it in the code or outside the code. So if you do it in the code, you could wait until Pedro collects your fungus, <laughs> sequences it, describes it, and then you realize, oh, that's the ITS sequence that I had. Now I know a name for it. Or you could use the environmental sample as a type, just the soil sample or the miscanthus grass. And that's been done. Paul Kirk here, on six seconds after midnight, January 1st, 2012, Greenwich Mean Time, published in Index Fungorum number one, which has an ISSN number, Pyromyces cryptodigmaticus. And if you look at it, you'll see he's got a holotype. And I have spies at Q. The type is a sample of semi-digested rumen content. That's a very polite name. <laughs> and there it is. Deposited in Q. Now, Keith was worried that we might equate gas and fungal taxonomy. Here, we've shifted phases to the solid phase. OK, or we could use DNA sequence as the type. Some years ago, Don Reynolds pointed out that DNA specimens can be used as a type. And since the printed sequence is an image of the sequence, you could probably use the printed sequence as a type. But I want to talk more about how to do it outside the international code. And last year, there were some emails. And Walter Gom sent me an email. This is, we'll teach you, Walter, never send an email. It might be used. <laughs> DNA typified environmental taxa can be characterized as candidate taxa. At the moment, they fall, of course, outside the botanical mycological code. To me, they need not be codified. And I asked Walter about this today, and he says, sure, you can use it. It's a fact. So outside the code, we don't have to worry about the code. That could be a good thing. <laughs> Name in comparison to sequences from validly named species. I think that's what we have to do. And we would use phylogenetics to determine the appropriate rank. So I'll give you some examples here. So let's go back to our uncultured fungus. So I'm going to go back to the broad view. And if we look at all of the sequences there, there are two of them that are cultured. One was called a tremolales species, one trichosporinales. They were cultured. Um, someone's got them in their collection, but they were never published and never put in a collection, as far as I know. Here are two that were cultured and published, cryptococcus species and a cryptococcus, another cryptococcus species. And then there's one on here. Phylobacidium merhardensi, um, that is, has a culture and is deposited in a major culture collection. So there are 95 Enes fungi and one in a collection 
and published. So it looks to me that the best that we could say about this is it's in the Cirrobacidiaceae. It's definitely in the Tremolites. I think you could say it's in the Cirrobacidiaceae. That's all you can say at this point. Now, Pedro mentioned MycoID. So actually, while I was at the CBS meeting the other day, I had a, little, a few moments sitting in the meeting. And I took that same sequence and put it in their um, uh, search, in their blast, to blast against the CBS sequences. And I got Cryptococcus ameniacus, amen ameniacus, which was not in GenBank. It's one of those sequences that's in, in MycoBank, in the CBS, in the IMA MycoBank, but not yet in GenBank. And so I thought, well, maybe this is it. But over here, they have a rating of, of uh, how, good, how good the uh, sequence and the name is. And it's low here. It could be high, but it's only one. So I think with this one, we're still safe calling it in the Cirrobacidiaceae. Here's another one, Phaeospheria. If you do the blast, you get Phaeospherias. If you make the tree, you get Phaeospheria. I think Phaeospheria species in Enas, that's probably safe. Here's a Candida. Candida blattii It's the closest one, so you could be happy with that. Candida blattii enas. If you make the tree, however, you see here's the sequence. The closest one is Candida acabinensis. So if you make a tree instead, maybe it's Candida acabinensis. And then if you don't trust that tree and make your own, you can, take, you can get those sequences out of GenBank, throw them in muscle to align them, put them in mega, and, and get a tree. And here, you can see it's actually basal to a clade that has a named one. So it could be equally distant, it's equally distant from any of them. So probably just Canada species is the way to go. And finally, here's Pischia, one of the ones that we found in our, in our search. And if you do the tree, it's next to a Pischia, and it's nested with Pischia membrana fasciens all the way out. I think you're pretty safe giving it a species name. In fact, does it even have to be an enus? It's probably Pischia membrana fasciens. So I think it's going to be possible to do this. Um, that question that someone gave Pedro in the last talk is how will it be done? That's going to be a toughie. And when someone finds a fungus that now defines a clade, how will that information be translated back to, to change those names? That's going to be a toughie, too. Now, there are problems. There's sequencing error. So name a sequence as an ENS only when it's been found by two labs. Turns out some of the matches that we found for ours where we'd edited out the singletons were to singletons from other studies. So singletons can give you information, too. There's intragenomic ITS variation. There's a nice recent paper from, by Lindner and Bannock on Latiparus. This is a nice tree of seven Latiparus species where they picked the consensus sequence. But when they looked at the deep reads, at, at all the sequences that they found, there are a number here with these gray arrows that are from a specimen of Cincinnatus, but are found all over the tree polymorphism in the ITS in one species. And I asked Lindner to go through and throw out all the singletons and repeat that study. And he did that for me. And so I'm going to, going to um, now enlarge this. So you can see that in Sulfurius, there are clades, there are sequences that came from Cincinnatus but are just like Sulfurius. Here's, a, here's another one that came from Cincinnatus that's basal to Gilbertsonii, so it's real. Cincinnatus is promiscuous. If you were in, in Amsterdam, in fact, the other day, I was walking between here and the train station, and there's a section where the trees are covered with Cincinnatus. It's a very promiscuous fungus. ITS is very poor for phylogenetic placement. That's true. We need ITS plus large subunit at least. Remember, these are environmental sequences. We don't have the whole organism. We don't have necessarily the whole genome. We need contiguous pieces of DNA to get the information. So we have to wait for better next generation sequencing so we can get ITS and LSU on the same read. Then it'll improve that problem. The other problem is ITS alone cannot recognize species. That's true. We would need very long reads or good metagenomics to try to do that. Or a database po populated with probably not 1,000 fungi, but 10,000 fungi, uh, fungal genomes. So Joey, you've got more work to do there. 
But remember, there's only one argument for action. All other arguments are for inaction. And it's something I think we really have to address. So what are others doing? This is what people in the prokaryotic world do. A proposal for recording the properties of putative taxa, implementation of the provisional status candidatus for in incompletely described pro prokaryotes, which means prokaryotes for which you don't have a culture, you only have a DNA sequence. So could we use candidatus as a prefix? Well, I took the liberty of taking one of David Hawksworth's emails from last year, too, where he says, I do not like using this prefix, candidatus. It looks like a generic name and can be taken to be such by non-specialists. And we know that the taxa are real and in many cases are already specimen, there already is a specimen-based genus they belong to. I agree with David. I don't like the candidatus. I don't like it, especially in front. If it was a suffix, I'd be happier with it. Now, the bacterial world, I think, presents us with a cautionary tale. And Uwe mentioned today that in the code, there's no specification on how you recognize a species. And that's a good thing. Because the bacteriologists are saddled with these criteria that are in their code. That you have to have 16S sequence, which is very valuable for rapidly placing an isolate down to the genus level. And then for final identification of species, they require DNA, DNA hybridization. Well, when I went to Berkeley 32 years ago, people were doing DNA, DNA hybridization. I don't think you could find a lab that does that now. And it wouldn't tell you anything. So to describe a bacterial species is very difficult because their groups, committees or commissions, unlike the one in the fungi, theirs are bureaucratic. You apply to it. You apply to it, and they determine if it can be a species or not. Ours are judicial. Ours look at conflicts. And judicial groups have A or B, and they have to make a decision. Bureaucratic groups don't have to make a decision. Okay? So what happens is there are fewer than 12,000 described bacteria and archaea. How many actual bacteria and archaea are there? Huge number. So it doesn't work. And they've only 400 of these candidate species have been proposed. So that's, I think, not the route to go. So coming back to this slide with all these uncultured um, fungi, my point is we cannot wait. We have to figure out what we're going to do here. And part of it is that taxonomy, he, here we're looking at taxonomy and nomenclature as something into itself. But it serves a much larger field. And for example, it serves ecology. And we've talked about different user groups. And this week in Nature, in fact, the cover of Nature is an article on fear of fungi. And it's about the unintentional transport of fungi from continents to continent and the ensuing disasters that happen. And these are the amphibians that have been wiped out by Betraco Kitchen. So, and, and much of that work, ecological work, is the work that's generating the ENAS fungi. So it's a big problem. And we, as those concerned with nomenclature and taxonomy, are the ones who are going to have to come up with a solution. Thank you very much.